Welcome back, guys, to another episode of the JPS Podcast. And joining me today is co-owner and COO of JPS, my business partner and brother, Samuel Skepis. And in today's episode, we talk about the landscape of fitness business amidst lockdown policies due to COVID-19. So this was a really cool opportunity to sit with Sam, reflect on what the hell has just happened, uh, what we're doing about it now, and what's coming up for us uh, as a company. And we also look at how the industry responded and some of the thoughts we have on how COVID-19 and everything that's unfolded due to this pandemic will impact um, the business uh, of fitness moving forward. So firstly, just some housekeeping. I want to thank everyone who downloaded a copy of the Home Gym Templates. We've had over 5,000 downloads now, which uh, is truly incredible. And I hope you're all finding your feet with your at-home training and now making some gains. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to let you all know that we have three courses, seminars, and events that are now online via Zoom due to uh, the COVID-19 Uh, social distancing policies. So we have our Strength and Physique course, which is a two-day course covering everything that you need to know about building muscle and strength. So this is being held on May the 2nd and 3rd, as I said, via Zoom. And this actually combines three of our previous workshops into one huge weekend. And it's jam-packed with nearly everything that an aspiring coach or athlete needs to know about uh, building muscle, gaining strength, and the most commonly sought after goals uh, by lifters, undoubtedly. Uh, And it's designed to give participants the understanding of how to achieve these uh, goals uh, in a safe, efficient, and effective manner. So check that out. I'll put the link in the description box below. And next up after that, on May the 9th, we have the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference uh, Wireless. So the UABC Wireless. So in light of the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic, unfortunately, we can no longer host the UABC 2020, and we've had to push that forward until next year, June 2021. However, the JPS team and our 11 eager and truly amazing presenters can't help but feel obliged uh, to do something uh, as opposed to nothing. So we've come up with uh, what we think is the next best thing uh, for all of our attendees who purchased tickets to this year's event, as well as uh, anyone else who would like to join in on the action from the comfort of their own home. So the UABC Wireless will now be split into three hourly panels and is accessible from the comfort of your own home. All you need is your laptop, phone, your PC, and a stable internet connection. So the first panel is Nutrition for Health and Wellbeing. We have Gab Fundaro, Mal Davies, Danny Lennon, and Jake Lenardin. The second panel is Nutrition for Performance and Physique with Eric Trexler, Jackson Pios, Eric Helms, and Lauren Conley. And the third panel is a training roundtable with Eric Helms, Greg Knuckles, Luke Tullock, and myself. So as I said, uh, 9th of May, guys, link is in the description box below, and it's only 59 Australian dollars uh, to join. The third event uh, or course that we have that is now online is my programming masterclass, which I was originally going to hold in-house at JPS and limit uh, numbers to 20 for this day. However, given the changes uh, in how we're going to be hosting this, I've uh, decided to extend uh, the amount of people that we can have attend. So it is open for enrollment again. So this is on June the 13th and we'll cover everything that you need to know about program design. So we'll talk about the fundamental concepts of uh, exercise science, the training principles, the training variables, and how to program for varying levels of advancement, how to troubleshoot stalls and plateaus, how to plan long-term training plans and everything else in between. Better yet, participants will see me work through a series of case examples where I'll demonstrate step-by-step how I program for my clients uh, and hopefully you guys can get an insight into the monitoring adjustments and the uh, coaching process. Uh, so this will uh, be a really cool experience and I hope uh, you guys can join me. Link for the description, uh, link is in the description box below. And finally, we have our Diet Adherence ebook, which has just been released, which was written by uh, our very own, my colleague, Martin Rafalo. So if your clients are struggling to stick to their diets, you're in luck. This book is extremely comprehensive, but very easily digestible and super pragmatic. 
and outlines the key components that will influence how well or how poorly somebody can stick to their diet. So this topic of adherence and compliance has required a lot more attention and I'm really fortunate Martin has stepped up to put together this book because it does provide a very useful framework and actionable strategies for us coaches uh, to help improve our clients' adherence. And I think uh, our industry has needed a book like this for a very long time. So from goal setting to motivation and the nebulous process of making last and changes to our behavior, uh, this book does cover it all and it's only $9.99 so you can pick it up uh, for an absolute bargain on the JPS website. And again, the link is in the description box below. So guys, that's about it from me. Uh, Apologize for the longer than usual uh, introduction, but uh, I do appreciate uh, those of you who stuck that out. Uh, because as you know, we run a business and we do need to uh, make dollars and cents uh, to operate and ensure that we can continue to provide free content such as this. So without further ado, I present you Samuel Skeppis. Ellie. It's good. Anyway, um, how are you feeling today? Yeah, good, good. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're still recovered from yesterday? Recovered? Yeah, mm-hmm. I knew like sore and fatigued emotionally drained from losing in poker oh yeah oh. that that hurt make sure you make sure you include this part yeah, in the I um, I podcast will include this part. <laughs> i was like was, what? the banter was strong I'm like i didn't train yesterday <laughs> maybe you <laughs> should have saying? maybe i should have I, mean, I would have had more mental faculties um how did the second game go who won you did again i heard that's right very good. Very good. Honesty, honesty is the best policy, JD. You just tell people what you've got every single time, and they they seem to undo themselves. So that's my that's the strategy. It's a winning strategy thus far. It's, it's the reverse. <laughs> so before bluff. we start, it's the reverse bluff. But it's not even a reverse. It's not even a reverse plus bluff. It's just well, it is. Truth it's is the it. truth. I didn't. I I didn't lie. I didn't lie. Or once they're like, oh, what have you? What have you got, Sam? I'll tell them, and then. They're like, oh, and then they play anyway. And I'm like, uh. um, so you've got my bank details, yeah? You're lucky. You only lost once. They lost twice. There's a second one for, for keeps too. Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. I probably would have played. Um, anyway, we'll get into this. So this is a very sort of candid discussion between Sam and I. We don't really have anything too formally prepared. And as you can tell, um, you know, we've been uh, playing some poker and getting amongst various other activities uh, during lockdown to pass the time. But what I thought would be really cool uh, to do is to sit down with Sam and have a chat. For those of you who don't know, Sam is my younger, smaller, weaker, worse looking, inferior poker playing little brother. Um, Are you happy with that description, Sam? I think it's fair. <laughs> um, as long as you transfer me my 25 bucks. <laughs> yes, you will get that. Um, but Sam and I have been in business <clears throat> together or in at least some capacity working together uh, for nearly, what, eight years? A decade. Yeah. Nearly uh, well, 10 for me. No, nine years. Nine years for 10 you, this I think. year. Yeah. Um, which is a very long time. And we've, we've been uh, in the fitness industry coaching people, uh, running facilities and doing what we can to sort of not just get by, but to, to live quite a enjoyable life and one that is, you know, full of all the luxuries that we want to have. And I thought it would be really cool to have a chat with Sam so that we could hash out what has just unfolded uh, and talk about the landscape of the fitness uh, industry and uh, business for not just JPS, but uh practitioners and the industry at large uh, amidst lockdown policies due to COVID-19 um, and basically just uh, reflect on what the hell has just happened, how it impacted JPS, how it impacted uh, everybody else, uh, how we responded to that and how others also uh, responded to the changes uh, thrust upon us uh, due to COVID-19 and then what impact this will have uh, on our business and the fitness game moving forward. And I think these are discussions that won't have an answer 
Uh, but I hope that uh, we will at least be able to illuminate uh, some good ideas and have some thought-provoking discussion. And given that Sam is in charge of operations and the business side of JPS and anyone who has worked with us in uh, any kind of business capacity will have dealt with Sam. So I'm very much just the uh, the pretty face that uh, does all the, the fun, nice and easy stuff, I guess. But Sam's the one uh, behind the scenes uh, really making sure that, um, you know, this uh, the cogs in the wheel are all working together. So Sam, let's uh, kick things off with uh, when you initially realized that COVID-19 was going to for lack of a better word, fuck shit up for JPS? Um, I would say, like, early on in the piece, um, obviously, like with Dave, one of our close friends who um, is from Australia, living in China, um, getting a lot of, say, information from him, from people. Well, he was actually in Australia at the time, um, for those that don't know. So he was getting information from a lot of his like friends and um, like colleagues and stuff in China and things just seem to be progressing quite rapidly. Um, <clears throat> like the, the spread rate, um, the kind of the pandemony and then the subsequent like, you know, lockdowns, closures, um, you know, and all the interventions that they were kind of implementing. Um, and as that was kind of unfolding, it was like spreading around the world quite rapidly. You know, cases were just like kind, did you, kind of Did you think increasing that at that time it was a lot of sort of, um, you know, hysteria? Because I know that, uh, you know, when Dave was telling, uh, us, look, telling us about it, I felt that it was not necessarily something I didn't, that would hit home in Australia. I almost felt as if we I were a bit of a special snowflake. I didn't, I didn't look, I, it's serious like anything, but... I think it's very hard to grasp the seriousness of something when it's just, it's so distant. It's, it's so, um, so distal to like kind of us and what we're doing, something you see on the news, something you hear to people talking about, but it hasn't affected us. So it's kind of like, it's not even that serious. Um, but I think like January, the like stock markets were like fucking going like insane just with everything going on. Um, like there's been a lot happening um like in the global economy for the last like you know three four months and i think that was my biggest concern was like the australian dollars getting like so like weaker and weaker um like with china getting like shut down that was going to have a negative impact on you know us like you know through trade and stuff like that and i you know hear firsthand that from like body close friend of ours um and yeah i don't know i just as it, as it like kind of developed and it's like became more of a factor in Australia, we started to get cases. I started to, yeah, I just, I just felt like our closure was kind of inevitable. I thought I always thought it was going to happen. Um, to your credit, you were very much uh, wary and preparing for the closure of JPS long before there was even talks about closing gyms. You were, you were putting like pressure on me to, um, you know, start thinking ahead. We need to prepare worst case scenario, shutting down, um, you know, memory serves around February. And yeah, I think, uh, the gyms like closed officially in, uh, or even late January, you might've been, and, uh, the gyms closed late March. So you were a month. They, 20, 23rd they they 20, were 23rd. Shot. yeah so you were you were really- I reckon maybe maybe like a week or two maybe two weeks i was just planning for the worst at every stage it was kind mm-hmm. of like as they introduced more and more like measures um you know so like social distancing and it was like 1.5 meters and it was one person per like four square meters and then you know we were fortunate that we introduced like um those sanitary like the sanitizer wipes in like um, December before all of this hit. Um, But yeah, like increasing cleaning, like just trying to take every reasonable measure that was in our control. Like at the end of the day, you can't help if people don't follow and don't abide by it. But um, my, uh, yeah, I know just trying to be ahead of it as much as possible. 
like early on just meant that we wouldn't have to then reel when you know in, like changes came like as they made changes in other industries I, I think it just made sense to mm. to look to what was happening and they're like you know shutting down you know all sorts of kind of non-essential businesses or they're making these um like practices or new measures to try and mitigate the spread and just like where possible just introduce them and try and um stay on stay operational as long as possible mm. and i guess let's uh go off in a little sidebar here because I think this period really highlighted to me just how formidable a team we really are um, by virtue of some of our personality traits and the way that we approach various problems because um, you were very much as I mentioned across all of the very serious changes that were coming our way um, preparing for that and you're you're very rationally skeptic uh, skeptical sorry and you know at times pessimistic but it's it's a realism that a business needs that if i was working alone i wouldn't be able to have because i'm you know on the other end of the spectrum i'm you know quite um an opportunist i you know try to see the silver lining in everything optimistic um and that sounds like a really sort of positive attribute to have in business um but rest assured everyone listening that it has gotten me into more trouble than uh, Sam would like to uh, recall. But uh, for the most part, I think this really, this period uh, and the shutdown of our business, which we'll talk about more specifically uh, in a minute, uh, really sort of highlighted to me that a good business thrives on a healthy balance of pessimism and optimism. I think you and I sort of complement each other in that regard um, because, yeah, you were very much planning for the worst, whereas I was, you know, trying to think forward um, as how we could, you know, create, innovate, adapt and do all of these kind of things without sort of, um, you know, worrying too much about, um, I guess, the not the consequences, but um, knowing that you were taking care of all of the um, cleaning up, so to speak, I could focus on... Um, you know, what we had, like laying the bricks for what was ahead whilst you were sort of, you know, cleaning the ones that we were currently, um, you know, just laid down or whatever the case may be. It's a pretty bad analogy, but I hope it made sense. Um, would you agree with anything? Do you have anything to sort of speak to that point? I think like probably the best thing that we did as a collective was, <clears throat> I think for anything like this, like decision-making is probably the hardest part. Um, it's like you don't want to be too like knee-jerk kind of reaction in making decisions like you know we could have just told everyone to like pack up go home we're going to close before this hits um like some other businesses that like we know have done and also like <clears throat> making decisions on like communication is probably the most important important aspect because then if you're ahead of it it's like telling a five-year-old hey in five minutes you know you're going to have a bath rather than just like being like hey you're having a bath um it's like yeah. giving people that time to kind of um, come to terms with what's going on, but you because it's so un, it's so new and uncharted territories, and we really don't know what's going on either. Um, and and the landscape's changing, you know, day to day. <clears throat> the I think one of the better things we were was like, and um, this is like a credit to not just us, but you know the other guys in like management from JPS is just like communicating in a way with our like clients, members, staff and one another that was like we were prepared to make decisions where if and when necessary and we were communicating that we were ready to make those decisions um rather than just you know burying our heads in the sand or just being like let's just act now um i think we made the right you know for the most part the right decisions when we needed to um and we held off making decisions um when we didn't need to to bring, to bring, I think that's probably the most. Let, let's thing. bring poker uh, into this to to help pe- give people an idea of uh, what Sam's saying I don't know there. If I, you should, if you should be talking about poker, yes, though, you don't have the credentials. No, I don't. Uh, my street cred is seriously low, guys. But I think, yeah, just to give that a little bit more um, like context, I think, um, yeah, the decisions we made and when we made them and how we made them, as well as how we went about getting to those decisions. Um, was very much akin to, uh, you know, playing a good, 
hand in poker. It's like we didn't force things at the wrong time. We weren't too tentative to, you know, let somebody else, uh, you know, out bet us in that sense. Um, we literally made the, as close to what we could possibly perceive to be the best decision, um, you know, card by card as it came out. So flop, uh, you know, the turn of the river. Like we, we literally played like as things started to unfold, I think the hand that we were dealt, um, the best that we could play it um, you know, at various points in the COVID-19 sort of uh, evolution. But um, yeah, I think uh, we were very fortunate to have a community that was also quite supportive too. So big shout out to everyone at JPS. But uh, something else I thought uh, that we could discuss um, that's uh, very much obviously related to this is how this has added an additional uh, layer of complexity to the way we now operate. So to give everyone some context, if you're not fully up to speed with uh, JPS and I guess our business model, we have a brick and mortar facility you know, in Melbourne, Australia, and that's where we coach. We have 15 coaches uh, who operate out of our facility um, as well as physios, chiros. We have uh, also um, you know, a management team. We've got uh, communications, digital marketing, um, education team, all this sort of stuff. And then there's uh, our admin uh, staff as well. So we've got, uh, I guess, a lot of skin in the game in that sense. We're not just an online content uh, creating company that does uh, you know, a lot of the things. There is something behind it. So when COVID-19 came about, we basically had to shut down our facility uh, to ensure that we would flatten the curve and stop the spread of the virus. But that has meant we have been jolted into a very small component of our business, um, but not just to do that, which is our online coaching and stuff like that, but to also continue to try and operate and run our brick and mortar facility in some ways. And I think that's uh, quite unique because a lot of um, you know companies might not have been doing as much extens or as much work to the same degree that we have online. So this change has sort of shifted them into uh, the digital economy, so to speak. Whereas for us, we we already had one foot in the digital economy, one foot in the um, you know brick and mortar facility, and this has. Uh, merged both together, I guess. Would you agree, Samuel? And what do you think um, that has meant for yeah, us? I, th I think, yeah, that was like the, one of the hardest and probably the largest challenges we face was it's like the brick and mortar facility would be anywhere from 70 to 80% of our work. Um, and that's where the largest portion of our team operates, you know, from our coaches and admin. Um, without the brick and mortar, there's you know vastly less work to be done. Um, but in saying that, we're also fortunate in that we had already spent the last you know three four years building um, <clears throat> our online services, namely our education services, mm. um, to a point where they would. It's a it's a we're not scrambling, uh, uh, you know when when all this hit, we we weren't you know, caught off guard. We already had a lot of, you know, courses, stuff like kind of ready to go, workshops, all of these things. So it was kind of like, okay, now instead of focusing our attention here and here, we're just kind of like going to go here. And then how can we now adapt our brick and mortar or in-person services to, we want to replicate that online, um, you know, and that's what we're trying to do. And well, it's not so much replicate, doing with it's, more so, it's more so we're trying to, fill the void that online coaching cannot um, because there is many things about online coaching um, that just don't um, satisfy the criteria that um, many people would want um, to be satisfied um, through in-person uh, coaching or training at a gym facility, uh, namely the you know, human connection, the in social interactions, um, that hands-on personal uh, touch when it comes to guidance, feedback, all those sorts of things. I think even the best online coaches still struggle to 
um, bridge that gap. And I think that's instead of trying to replicate, we're more so trying to innovate to a degree to create something that would be more suitable to our in-person clients who weren't suited to online coaching, but also brought about a sense of community and kept us connected um, as a team as well um, with you know, some uh, education and stuff uh, filtered in. And that's where we came up with uh, our virtual group coaching, um, which is, uh, you know, daily uh, group training sessions. We have like, you know, proper program that I've written up um, and we have uh, weekly educational lectures and a virtual masterclass each week, um, which are pretty cool. So I think, yeah, the hard part was trying to determine what was going to be best because there's, there's many trains of thought there. One is you don't try to create a service that won't last beyond this sort of COVID-19 uh, lockdown uh, period uh, because what's the point of you know, creating a new service that you're not going to use long term? And the other idea is that you should create something or it doesn't matter what you do, but you've just got to survive. And if that means creating a service that might not necessarily um, be sustainable long term, uh, then you do it. So what, upon reflection, what do you think about how uh, we approached that if we are to sort of use those two uh, choices uh, to make a decision from? And did we make the right, right call? Um, well, I think from like a business standpoint, like during times like this where it's just no one knows what's going on, I think you need to be open to, and it's like generally speaking, you need to be open to having services that maybe you cut. It's like, you know, it's like if it's under an underperforming service, it's like maybe you can just get rid of it. Um, or if it's no longer warranted or if you have something that's different or better, that's it. I think virtual group coaching very well could stand the test of time and be something that we run long term um there's certainly been you know a handful of people who have said you know this is great like you know hoping that we and asking us to continue it uh beyond COVID-19 but I think if the say return on investment and if the kind of if the uh, fruit isn't worth or the juice isn't worth the squeeze um you know then we cut it but if it is we keep it going like um you know I think that all fitness businesses and just businesses in general should probably be aiming to have um, as many diverse um, and independent sources of income for their business so that you're not, and I think that's why we're, we're probably fortunate, right? It's like, yes, memberships and personal training, they're a large part of our business, but we had the education, we have online workshops, we had online coaching, you know, now we have virtual group coaching. We have these other sources of revenue that will allow us to continue. If you just have one source and then that's wiped out because of fucking pandemic, well, then what are you going to do? Um, you, your business goes under. So I think long term, I think we've made a good decision. Um, I think that the virtual group coaching that we have, no doubt it will change over the coming months and rightly so as we try and adapt it and make it better um, in line with kind of what our community wants and needs. And what is most appropriate for their health and fitness. Um, but I think we've done a good job. I think, I don't, yeah, I don't know. If it's going well and people want to see it there long term, then we keep it. If it's not, then we just shift our attention to other things. I think more than anything, um, now, this time has will give people, everyone uh, who trains at a gym, an appreciation for how much they rely on the the in-person socializing, the communicating, that contact, physical contact, even if it's not actual physical, but being in contact with other people um, to kind of get them through their training and to keep them on track and motivated. It's not just going to a gym. We can still go and train at the gym. It's still not as motivating training in an empty gym with all the equipment as it is. You know, it's, it's about the same fucking, same level of motivation someone would have training with home equipment you know it's like other people help you stay motivated motivated and stay accountable um so i think that this is just kind of reinforced that to us as a fitness business and to our clients members community and the general public who are now kind of reeling going i can't do this 
I need, I was like, why aren't gyms open? Why aren't gyms essential? We all know why gyms aren't essential because, um, you can exercise fucking anywhere. You can exercise at home like everyone is doing, you know, you can lift up, you know, slab of waters. You can lift up, you've got dumbbells at home. Everyone's got a home gym now. So you can train, you can train from anywhere. Um, and by closing gyms, they've mitigated having lots of people in contact with one another, touching, you know, surfaces and objects and potentially spreading things. So it was a good call to close gyms. Um, but yeah, I think people will be itching to come back to the gym and those who have say been exposed to say different gyms or facility or coaching services by way of online services there's a strong possibility that they will, you know, if they geographically cannot get to that gym and they have an online service, then I imagine that there will be a market for those online services to continue in some capacity when this is all done. Yeah. And I think to speak to the point that you first raised about how we were fortunate to have uh, the education component of our business well and truly up and running pre COVID-19, uh, I like to, yeah, just let every sort of business owner or coach out there know that one of the best things that I ever learned, almost useful things that I've learned that sort of paid the highest return for the piece of advice that was given uh, was that in order to mitigate the risks that were going to come my way in, uh, you know, being a sole trader and, you know, then growing the company uh, was to diversify my services uh, and revenue streams so that I wasn't solely relying on uh, my in-person coaching to generate uh, revenue. And we began Samuel working on that back in, oh, I would say nearly 2015. What's that, the education start? Yeah. Like I started mentoring coaches. Uh, we had our 12 week mentorship yeah. course I was starting Would have been to, 2014. Yeah, really. We ran the first mentorship in 2015. The first yeah. like 12 week mentorship was run in 2015. Yeah, and, and you were mentoring before then. Yeah, so and doing I think workshops. We we're lucky uh, in that sense um, to have gone that route uh, early okay. on, but there's obviously an, a number of trade offs that you have to make when you start diversifying um, your spreading your resources more thinly across a number of different uh, revenue streams. The time is obviously a finite resource and all those sorts of things. Um, but I think the principle is a very useful one uh, for people in business. And uh, moving from there, I want to really discuss today now what uh, you think of how people in the industry uh, responded. Now, obviously, we should sort of uh, caveat this with the fact that um, our understanding of the industry is very limited. We um, associate with and uh, you know, network or communicate with um, a very small portion of people in the, the fitness industry. Uh, but I guess you know, within our community, Samuel, how did you think that people responded uh, to obviously having to close their facilities and then just the shift in the way that... Uh, people were training and uh, tackling their health and fitness goals? I think there's been a very, without like overselling it, but a largely uniform kind of approach from a lot of the personal, like from the say private facilities at least. Um, from what I've seen, we'll start with commercial gyms. Most commercial gyms have just shut up shop. They're typically, especially the franchises, anytime good life snaps, um, they just close their doors, locked, locked everything up, and kind of that's it. We're just they're just waiting it out um, for because well because they're larger operations. There's so many facilities, and they're all kind of governed by like the same guiding principles and um, you know policies and things like that. Uh, they're probably a lot more restricted in the way they operate. Um, but then obviously you have the coaches who work out of commercial gyms. Um, from what I've seen, most of the coaches operating out of small commercial facilities have just moved all their coaching online and are really putting a lot of time and effort into being active on social media, educating and providing value uh, to their clients in the community. Uh, Braden Cadden had a video about this the other day 
and whether or not that is the most worthwhile use of people's time. Um, I tend to agree with him to some extent that I think a lot of these sole trader um, or, you know, contractors who are working out of commercial gyms are probably investing a lot of time and effort into things that won't actually have a return on that investment of time, um, you know, spending, you know, hours coming up with content, you know, recording stuff. At the end of the day, it's like you need to be coaching people um, or selling, you know, service, other services or even products. Um, otherwise, you're just building goodwill. Um, goodwill is great, but if it doesn't get you through the next, you know, three, four, five months, however long it is, um, it's worth nothing because, you know, you've got bills to pay. Uh, they don't stop. Yes, the government's helping. Um, then the private facilities, so like ours, um, a lot of them have been like renting and leasing out equipment. I was initially uh, completely against the idea. I thought, what a fucking nightmare. Um, I saw JP Couchy from the Strength Fortress doing it and I was like, fuck that, that's ridiculous. And then we spoke about it and then we had a lot of interest for it. And then I was like, you know what, let's do it. We don't need all the equipment. Um, that's been a good way to firstly get some revenue for for us and other private facilities. Um, it's not heaps. I'd much rather have a, a fully functioning gym full of people, but uh, having an empty gym with people, you know, paying to lease equipment is better than a kick in the teeth. So there's been that. <clears throat> then other private facilities, um, some have been like shifting their focus more to a, towards like uh, education, um, building online like training services. So, so like online group training or they're running Zoom meetings with their clients. I don't know whether they're charging for these things, but again, it raises that point of how much free work can you do to sustain your business? Um, yeah. And then just like people around the world, I think, um, you know, just seeing so many people just training at home and it kind of creates this sense of, oh, we're all in this together. Look at us all training from home, um, you know, which is good for morale, I suppose. But again, um, you know, we need everyone needs people like from the coaching industry to be wanting to work with them and i think a lot of clients members things like that the and rightly so are suspending their services because they can't get the most out of it but um i would say that now with everything the way it is i think more more than ever we're probably exposed to more deleterious like kind of health consequences um you're at home more, you're around food more, mental health is probably suffering. Maybe you've lost your job, your hours are being reduced, something negative is happening at work. Um, gyms are closed, you can't train, maybe you're not staying as active as you were. So maybe it is worthwhile spending, you know, 20, 40, 50 bucks a week to have a coach or to have someone who is helping you um, stay on track and guide you through that process. It's certainly been something that, you know, I've been hearing um, like every week. I just message all my clients to see how they're doing. It's like, you know that will that that's creating goodwill right that's not earning anything that's no there's no return on that investment um other than to find out how they're going and potentially troubleshoot some of them might pay for services some the vast majority probably not even though it's probably still a good idea to do so in some capacity um <clears throat> but yeah i don't know the, in, the industry is different and it will look a lot different when we go back i think a lot of the remote services will stand in some fashion, maybe not the way we're seeing them now. Um, I have a prediction think, that gym equipment uh, will be selling like hotcakes and supply will increase so much so that it exceeds demand and we're going to see a lot of people stuck with uh, That's equipment. going to happen straight away because yep. demand. <laughs> this is the same thing that happened with, toilet paper right it's like everyone's gone and bought up on toilet paper right so su supply can't meet demand short term so then they start to supply more and more and then eventually there's an oversupply and demand just fucking plummets because everyone's used that demand earlier that's why supply was so hot uh that's why demand was so high and then it just like drops and then it'll take you know a few months before it's back at kind of an equilibrium between supply and demand same thing will happen with gym equipment um 
everyone has, I will look, you know, as a facility, I look forward to potentially being able to buy some people's gym equipment cheap. Yep. I think, uh, I think I I was uh, actually having this discussion the other day uh, with Chris from JPS. And I said to Sam that we, I said to him that we uh, should definitely be uh, looking to buy equipment from people when this is all said and done. I think uh, it'd be prudent of other people who have facilities uh, to do the same because there's going to be a lot of uh, pretty much brand new, hardly used equipment on the market um, and you'll be able to snap it up for a you know, good price. Yeah. I think, you know, on the whole like gym equipment stuff, it's actually been good to see a lot of the retailers haven't been price gouging, um, which has been great. Like you certainly see it, and this is completely off topic for the fitness industry. This goes to, I suppose, everyone. But you see some stuff where it's like, you know, I saw a 50 pack of single use face masks for $80. It's like you can buy them for a handful of bucks online. Um, no one would buy those, I think. If they did, they'd probably be silly. But I think it's been good to see retailers like Iron Edge and Rogue and, you know, even Samtech not just like smashing up their prices to be like, well, you know, we only have a finite amount of stock and demand exceeds supply. So let's just, you know, increase the prices until demand drops. Um, it's more coming from the private say, sales. Like those people who had a fucking set of dumbbells in their garage, you know, then turn around and say they want 400 bucks for them. I think anyone who pays that is misguided for lack of a, well, I have better descriptive terms, but I'm not going to use them. Um, you can get by if you're creative enough. This is where having a coach or something would be handy because you could be like, oh my God, I can't do, you know, I don't have enough weight to do this. And they can tell you, hey, just go to Bunnings and buy fucking some sort of like a bag of cement and, you know, a broomstick and off like a metal bar and off you go. You can do a heap of exercises. Um, having gym equipment is a luxury. We all know it um, now more than ever because. Um, now we don't have it. We are, have been, for the most part, left without. So everyone's having to make do, and it's been great to see some people being really creative. Um, I th- I wonder, like, the thing that I wonder is, like, when gyms reopen, some people have, like, will have, like, full-on home gyms now. I wonder if we'll see a massive surge of people getting gym memberships again and then home gym equipment skyrocketing uh, sales um and no one buying it because no one wants it because they've got a gym membership or if we'll see gym memberships like slowly trickling back through and a lot of people not getting gym memberships because they have a home gym and that could again change the landscape maybe you get a you know i don't know who knows maybe in six months that instead of having you know say a thousand dollars for a year's gym membership you get a a weekday membership you know or maybe it's you have a membership for three days a week because now you have home equipment and you can do two of those day your training days at home. Who knows? I don't know. And we also have to consider that just because gyms open back up doesn't mean other businesses will necessarily open up or just because other businesses open up doesn't necessarily mean gyms will open up. Mm. So there's a strong possibility that other businesses will, I would think, precede us. So they'll open before us, which is probably a good thing because then people will save more money. I imagine bars and nightclubs and events and stuff will probably be later in the piece, um, later still, because unlike, say, gyms, yes, they're high pop, like um, highly populous kind of activities that going to the gym has health, physical, you know, mental, emotional kind of benefits, whereas going to a music festival or something has you know some benefit but not the same so hopefully hopefully in like you know three months to whatever whenever it is that you know people have some money saved up and they're willing to you know reinvest into their health and fitness and gyms you know they can pack the puzzles up and pick up some barbells yeah i, don't know. I also think that when gyms reopen there's going to be this lag time between when we'll be able to operate at full capacity. So I predict that there's going to be a lag time between when businesses will be able to operate 
uh, fully again, especially uh, in the gym and the fitness domain, because uh, we will see the premature reopening of the businesses um, because the job keeper ends in September, correct me if I'm wrong, meaning that uh, yeah. the government will have to open businesses because otherwise the economy will continue to turn to shit and therefore they're opening them too early. But to counteract that, they will impose uh, restrictions such as capping numbers in a facility at any one time, so on and so forth. And due to this, I suspect there will be a period um, before business will return to normal. I think uh, it'll be tough going and very slow pickings uh, for a few months. Um, people aren't going to be you know, willing to just jump back into getting personal training or spending a lot of money on uh, fitness stuff either, especially if they have been out of work um, or receiving significantly less, uh, you know, financially for, you know, six months or more. Uh, so that's just some thoughts I have on, uh, I guess the, the removal and lifting of the restrictions imposed on gyms. Hmm. I don't like, I think that the Australian government's done quite a good job. I think the six months is like, I want to think that they're just being conservative and erring on the side of caution by, um, preparing people for the worst. Um, I would be surprised if, like, we, we're going into winter as well, which means, um, like, the, like, flu rates and, like, kind of sickness rates, like, go up anyway, like, as we, like, head into and go through flu season in Australia. Um, so, unless, I yeah, I can't see gyms being open to a normal capacity. I certainly agree that there will be, um, serious like limitations on operation like we're a membership and a personal training facility but I imagine that when we've reopened we'll probably just need to be a personal training facility with no memberships um, so we can control the number of people on site at any one point in time uh, I imagine that will be something the four meter or what, the two square meter four square meter or whatever the rule is um, that will probably be in place um, yeah, I think we're nothing will return to life as we knew it until there is a vaccine, because there's no way you can open the borders up, because the it will always be there until there's a vaccine and like a way to create immunity against it. Um, short of every single country in the world locking every single person up with a hundred percent effectiveness, um, you know maybe then if like no one's for anyone else for like, and you just said, well, locking the entire world down for one month, no one moved, no one saw anything. Everyone stayed at home for a whole month. It's like, then anyone who's sick, it's like maybe uh, they can maybe go and get medical attention and help. Hopefully it's like, and even then it's like they're spreading it. And this is a fucking hypothetical. And so it's like, you would need to literally lock everyone in a room by themselves. Some people will get sick and die. And some people get sick and recover. Um, eventually, I would think that the virus would be eradicated from the human population. I would, maybe, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an immunologist. And then life could return. But that's not going to happen because that's a way bigger task than could reasonably be pursued. So the next best thing will be a treatment, um, which is hopefully not far off that I know there's a lot of pharmaceutical companies working on treatments that have been shown to be quite effective. The next hurdle is re um, getting it approved by like the FDA um, and the regulatory bodies and then mass producing it to get it out to people who need it. So until that medication or any treatments are available worldwide, I don't see how travel or businesses or anything could operate um, to the full, to their full extent. And, you know, who knows, that could be another year or two years, potentially. So six months, you know, I remember like when Malcolm Turnbull said, wait, Malcolm Turnbull, ScoMo, what am I thinking? When okay. ScoMo said, um, you know, these are six month measures the day that, or the night before they closed gyms, I was like, he can't be serious. Six months, like surely not. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as we've kind of got into it, it's like, well, probably will be six. It'll need to be six months. Um, you know, that takes us through to September and sees us through to the other side of um, flu season. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
with these measures that will keep the spread lower. They'll hopefully be able to deal with it. And by its time for pharmaceutical companies to hopefully come up with a treatment and produce enough of it to get it out to um, then slowly allow for peak for movement again, effectively, and for life to resume in some capacity or some to some extent of normality or normalcy or what as we knew it anyway. Who knows? Yeah. We're all just flying. we're all just guessing, you know. Even the government's guessing. Uh, they're just it's all best guesses. Mm. So, and I think I think something yeah. that I wanted to talk about uh, and at least share my thoughts on um, more formally was how people in the fitness industry have been advocating that other people should be responding, or not just the fitness industry, but how other people have all of a sudden become. Uh, armchair experts on how other people should uh, respond to and approach um, you know this lockdown period uh, whether it be with their their training their psychology uh, their diets uh, their mindset um, their business all these sorts of things and I think um, the people who are doing that um, you know without uh, being asked to by you know certain people or specific um, individuals that they're working with um, are doing more harm than good because I think things are so complex and every situation that uh, people are facing is so unique that we really don't know what we're doing. And I think um, for the most part, a lot of people have had the foundations of their life like ripped from underneath them and they need to put back the pieces um, before they can start to move forward. And, and we've had a lot of... Uh, this, I guess, burnout culture where people are, you know, advocating that if you haven't come out of lockdown with more knowledge, uh, more skills, uh, a new hobby, then you've wasted your time. Like that kind of mentality, I think, is very dangerous because, um, you know, shit's hit the fan for a lot of people. And I think the those who are adopting such a, I guess, one or unidimensional myopic sort of view of, responding to COVID-19 um, are generally, you know, uh, doing so from a place of decadence, you know, just uh, excessive luxury that they've had over their lives that hasn't been taken away from them. And I, I know uh, we uh, have someone who uh, we've had dealings with, uh, Nathan Wallace from Hold Your Own. Um, you know, he's had to close his facility due to uh, what's gone on. And I think uh, there's a, that's not spoken about enough. I would think her. Uh... Are you waiting for me to say something? No, I just yeah. If you've got any thoughts on that, feel free to add them. Otherwise, we'll uh, we can discuss um, you know what we're doing now um, to mm. obviously move forward. Yeah, I, I just think now now people are spending more time on social media probably than really ever. Um, you know, because most people are at home significantly more frequently than they normally would have been. Um, more time scrolling, more time reading. You know. I think it's great if you are, you know, actively pursuing, um, you know, further education. You maybe you're reading a bit more. Maybe you know, you're watching hopefully informative documentaries. Or it's like I don't know. If you're pursuing betterment of yourself in some capacity, I think that's great. Um, but I don't think, yeah, I, I don't know. I think forcing anyone forcing their views or like, you know, going out there being like, if you're you're wasting your time if you're not doing X, Y, Z thing or to think that there's only one way to approach this um, is just a very like simplistic way of looking at it. Um, you can, yeah, I know this, you can do anything in fucking isolation. You don't have to read, you don't have to upskill, do what you want to do. Um, you know, for a lot of people that might be having a well-earned, you know, break. Maybe it is just watching TV more. Maybe it's just spending more time with family, more time with kids. Maybe you just, like start cooking, but it's like using it in some way um, to your benefit. I don't think it all has to be bad. I think certainly a lot of it is bad. But in saying that, you know, we adapt very quickly as humans. And it's like, this is our new normal. Like, you know what I mean? Two, three weeks ago, everyone was complaining. This is shit, this is that. Now everyone's kind of like problem solved the sh things that we're like, you know, sucking in their life. Oh, I, it's like, I'm not working anymore. And over the last like, you know, three, four weeks, they've come up with solutions to keep themselves busy, whether it was like upskilling, maybe they're now working in a different capacity, um, you know, and now it's normal. This is normal for us now. You know what I mean? 
like everyone's back into like rhythms and routines for the most part. So yeah. that's my, yeah, that's my thoughts. Whether yeah. they contribute I, to- I totally agree. I, I think way. that the likely best approach to this now is going to be advising people to do what is ever best for them. Whatever they want. Yeah. No, it's not whatever they want. It's generally what people you want, short-term pleasures that doesn't actually align with their long-term goals. And that could be, you know, quite counterproductive. Um, but I think what people should be advising on the whole is to you know, really try to elucidate what is best for you, both during lockdown and moving forward, um, and then double down on that. And that's going to look different for everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, I guess the last thing we'll talk about is, uh, what we're doing now um, in JPS internally um, to, I guess, not just survive this period, but also thrive and uh, some of the things that we're uh, working on. So uh, I guess the underlying principle of what we're discussing here is uh, having a next. So something that uh, we're working on um, that will hopefully be, um, you know, a, a service that's going to flourish, a uh, product that's going to boom, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, and I think this is important because no matter how successful uh, we are today or yesterday or pre-COVID-19, I, we need to have something in the pipeline. Uh, I think we've been doing this for a long time um, because uh, over the course of the years, uh, the interest of certain things uh, starts to drop off, um, you know, times change, all those kind of things. So we've always had something that we're working on, um, which has not only kept us busy, but also kept us relevant, um, helped us diversify the business, stuff like that. So uh, do you want to talk about what we're doing now um, and some of the things we've got in the pipelines? Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> like, I suppose we're continuing to, for the most part, like push, for now our online um services and products as much as possible because really they're the they're kind of the they're the thing that we're able to build the most and benefit the most from in the short to mid term um but then beyond that um kind of looking more at how we can use and leverage off those products more so so building the education portal um i think you know, having a one-stop shop for, you know, education, subscription-based kind of um, content that is, you know, digestible and relevant to, you know, the general fitness community will be um, great. I think now that we have, we're afforded with more time than ever because less time on the gym floor, less time managing the gym, um, less time coaching behind the scenes. I think now we're afforded with an opportunity to really start to invest in that and push that along. Um, you know, other courses online. That's, yeah, that's it. Just like continuing to build on those kind of the foundations that we've built over the last few years from an educational kind of like an online um, online standpoint. Yeah, I think... Yeah, I think those like few projects that we're working on will be good. I think they'll be great. They're worth the investment, um, but time will tell. Mm-hmm. I think I think Very that they'll they'll be more than anything. They'll, they'll be valuable just because of what they are and what they offer, and it won't matter whether or not gyms are open or gyms are closed. Um, there'll be something to gain from it, no matter what kind of who you are or where you are, which is extremely important and valuable i think yeah totally what exactly. else are we working on we've got a couple of uh books in the works as well which is cool um yeah we're, we're looking to i guess well, you could say create services that are not dependent goods and services that aren't dependent on uh a physical location anything yeah They're anything the or anyone yeah and why do you think that's so necessary uh, in a fitness business? Um, can you repeat the question? Can you use uh, it in a sentence? Why do I think 
why do you think it's so beneficial for us to create some services that are self and products that are self-sustaining? In the point industry? for everyone to have products that are self-sustaining, um, because if you have self-sustaining products, that means that they can continue to generate revenue um, in the background while you shift your attention to other things, whether it's building on that product or service, you know, by adding more content or we're developing it. You know, we're going broader or deeper into, you know, topics or whatever it is, say, for the education portal. Or we're just saying, all right, that's now built, ready to go. Say the power thing fundamentals. It's built and ready to go. Now that will generate some revenue. It'll educate people. It'll give them an opportunity to learn about the sport of powerlifting, some exposure to us and a variety of other great coaches and educators around Australia and the world. And then we have the option to, now it's built, now it's ready online. Um, everything's kind of saved and ready to go. And now we can either diversify further. We can, you know, go and build another course, build the education portal, or we can add further depth to it by saying we're going to add in more content. We're going to, you know, like diversify the content within the course. We're going to add sections, components, whatever it is. Um, you know, maybe that leverages into a book. I don't know. Um, I just think that if as like personal training is very demanding, labor intensive work, you can only coach one person at a time. And this is always going to be the bottleneck. This is why coaches want their clients to leave them, uh, whether they re realize that or not. If you can do a good job with a client, then they can go off and tell other people about you and you can continue to build your web of or your reach um, and exposure by doing well, getting results with clients they go and tell um other people then those people come to you you get results with them they go and tell more people and hopefully you can grow your business if you're a sole trader or a single like operator at some point you only have a finite amount of time your prices are just going to either have to increase or you're going to have to earn uh, work out a way to earn further money whether you have people work underneath you whether you kind of expand your business uh, to have more income streams, I don't know. Um, but yeah, with like w when gyms return, we're going to have those labor intensive um, and time consuming services again. And I think they're absolutely essential to what we do um, because that gives us credibility from a, as a business uh, in the fitness industry, because we can go, Hey, look at us. We can, we can get, you know, someone onto the stage into, you know, into competition conditioning. We can do it in a way that's healthy and like healthy, um, you know, sustainable. And, you know, they didn't have to starve or suffer more than they needed to. We can say, Hey, look, we got, you know, Jane Doe down 20 kilos and she's changed her life for the better. Um, I think fitness businesses need both. I, you can be a great educator, but I think you need to be able to, it's like if you're just educating, then you're just educating. But if you want to be known as a coach and to be someone who gets results for people, you need you can't just be like an educator. Then you have it's like if that if that's what you do, you have to be getting people results and you have to be working with people um, in some capacity in a one-on-one -on -one fashion. I don't agree with like if you have like an online transmate or something, and you're not the if you're saying hey, it's run by. It, the Samuel Skeppis transformation and then I have some other random coaches yeah. running it and overseeing it. I think that's a bit shitty. Yeah. Yeah. But, no, I agree with that. Yeah, that's me. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I don't well, know. very interesting conversation. The future will be interesting. Yeah. I think that conversation was good. I think it was uh, at least a, a useful way to reflect for me. Um, think about like what we've done what we're doing what we're going to do i uh, hope the listeners enjoyed and uh, took something away from that uh, if you did feel free to let us know in the comments uh, below uh, you can find sam basically across all jps uh, related social media uh, and anything you want to say to round things off sam no um i think everyone should just Keep doing their thing, try and stay fit and active and not lose hope. We'll, uh, hope we will be back yeah. in some capacity in the future eventually. Yeah.
Thank you. It's All right, guys. No guarantees. No guarantees. Yeah, that's it. Well, no guarantees. Guys, I hope you like this Jacob episode. Jacob losing poker. That's a guarantee uh, that I will hopefully uh, change uh, shortly. Uh, but otherwise, like this uh, episode. Uh, feel free to follow us on uh, JPS uh, underscore education or JPS health underscore fitness on Instagram. Head to our website. Uh, we've got lots of content going up now that we are no longer operating our facility. So be sure to stay up to date with all of uh, that on our social media platforms. Speak to you all next time and thank you for listening. Sure.